welcome guests on the first bite of October. We're going to open the program and load in the project and then we're going to make a simple screen using the assets that are going to come with the project, explaining a couple of small things along the way. All right, so when we open up NestMaker and we load the project 13 bytes of October, we've already loaded in a ton of stuff. Most of my other tutorials have had you start by creating a new project, loading in the genre module of the project that you want, and then start either building or loading in assets. This project, though, is a pre-built project that we can then break apart and deconstruct and analyze how it works uh, and give everyone a good primer as we move into slightly more advanced stuff. Now, this entire tutorial series is really Really meant for beginners who are just getting started with NestMaker or are curious about it. Um, however, uh, we will delve a little bit into some basic assembly writing uh, later on. Uh, and what's important to know right now is that we have now loaded in a whole bunch of presets and assets uh, for this style game, which is going to be an arcade style uh, uh, platformer. And the, uh, you don't have to follow me on this step, but I want to show you real quick. There is a gear icon here at the top of the page. And if I put my mouse over it, you can see it says project settings. And if I go to my script settings, you can stretch this out if you need to see. These are all uh, most of the scripts that are part of this project that are unique to this type of genre. And I'll give you a great example. If I'm making a top-down adventure game, I don't need physics. Uh, I don't need gravity physics in my scripts, right? But if I'm making a platformer, I do. And because the NES has such a finite amount of memory, it's great that we can sort of shove off the stuff that we don't need and only include the stuff that we do need. So these scripts kind of get changed. And you can see some of them are listed as being part of the module for the arcade platformer. And other ones are not necessarily. They're just sort of general uh, 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 scripts that could serve all the modules. For instance, eight directional movement doesn't account for gravity. It's literally something moving in any one of eight random directions. It doesn't really observe gravity, whereas your regular move left does observe gravity. So my eight directional movement might be something for a floating monster or something like that, something that's in the sky that ignores gravity. So I'm not even, I'm not pulling it necessarily from the module of the arcade platformer. This is a universal eight direction movement script. So anyway, you don't have to know any about all that stuff really to get started. I just wanted to show it to you so you understood that this is what happens when you load in a module. It loads in all this stuff. We didn't just load in a module though, we loaded in a full game. If we want to see the assets that got loaded in, you can click on the plus sign, and this is all the stuff that makes up our game, this sort of hierarchy tree on the left side of the screen. This is all the stuff that makes up my game. So the maps for my game, the HUD design for my game, the colors, the objects, the text for NPC text strings, uh, the music and the sound effects and the scripts and the input controls. All these are the things that make up my game. We've already loaded in a bunch and I'm going to show you how we can find some of that. Now, again, you don't have to do this part with me, but if you want to, you can. If I go into my pixel editor, I can hit the open button here in the pixel editor ribbon above the pixel editor right here. And I, I hit the open button and these are the tile sets that are associated with this game. And all NestMaker projects by default are set up to have sort of a templated approach to the graphics. That makes it really easy for you to modify and not have to think about the code and including files, things like that. However, if you were an advanced user, you could mix this up and, and make modifications. The important thing to know is that generally you have one background, BCK, CHR, uh, on the screen at a time. And you could be in a mode where you have two of these at a time, or you have this and a few of these screen specific. That's BCK SS for screen specific at a time. Um, but we're, let's just take a look at one of these. So I'm going to look at BCK CHR 00 and hit open. And these are the background tiles for this. Now they don't look like much of anything. Um, you might probably be seeing something that looks like this. They don't look like anything right now because they're going through this uh, black RGB mode. But if I hit enable palette translation here in the ribbon, you can see they take on the colors of whatever color pa sub palette that I'm using. So here we see grays and blue. Here we see this sort of these warm tones and green. Here we see this orange, brown, and white. And here we see the pinks and the white, right? So this is showing me what these tiles would look like if they were going through this sub palette. This shows me what they look like if they're going through this sub palette. This shows me what they look like if they're going through this sub palette, et cetera. So you can kind of see some things jumping out like this, this sub palette is really used for collectibles like the candy. This is used for background tiles like this 
this gate and the moon maybe this mountain range um, and this is really used for a lot of the foreground elements this is actually ground which we'll see in a minute uh, a tree stump here this is sort of the center of a tree um, the zombie hand sticking out of the ground maybe this stump here so let's go ahead we're going to use this first tutorial very short tutorial on constructing a screen using this tile set that already exists in our game you don't have to create anything you don't have to load anything we're just going to go to overworld and what you should see is a blank screen so right now what i can do is i can move to any of these screens and i can see what their screen sort of identifier is up here this is x0 y0 this is x1 y0 this is x2 y0 if i come to this random screen you can see it's x13 y11 that'll become important when we want to deal with like warping from one screen to another but we don't really have to know that right now all i want to do is just construct a very simple screen for my player so i'm going to double click on this first screen and it's going to open up this screen inside uh this screen editor tool inside the screen editor tool i'm going to pick the colors that I want to create with. So I'm going to pick this second group of colors and I'm going to grab this ground tile right here. It kind of looks like the top is grass and the bottom is dirt. And I'm going to draw it under his feet by clicking and dragging under his feet. Now let's pretend I screw up. Oh, that's pretty common. I screwed up. It's very easy for me to just get the color black and draw right over the top of it. Now this is a problem because I don't have a solid ground color that matches this in my tile set but i'm going to show you a keyboard shortcut you have keyboard shortcuts of six seven eight and nine six will always draw the color black if you've got the the right side tiles loaded which we do for this project the seven key on the keyboard will always draw the second color in your sub palette so if i had this selected it would draw it gray if I had this selected, it would draw it brown. If I had this selected, it would draw this sort of yellowish color. If I had this selected, it would draw this light pink. Similarly, the eight key is the second uh, color. So this would be green. This would be darker brown. This would be this dark color pink. And nine is the last color. So this would be dark blue. This would be this dark sort of brown burgundy color. This would be white. And this one would be white. So we can use the six, seven, eight, and nine keys as keyboard shortcuts to draw solid colors without having to waste a space on my tile set. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to get the second tile set. I'm going to use the, the key. So I'm moving my mouse over to the position and I'm pressing the seven key. And you can see I've built a little screen. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, just decent screen design with using colors. I think this is uh, a pretty good trick. Uh, a lot of my foreground stuff is going to be using this sub palette and a lot of my background stuff is going to be using this and this allows me to make it very clear my warm colors are what my player can interact with and my cooler colors are what's in the background that is sort of non-interactable i'm going to do that by i'm going to i'm going to make a tree so i'm going to grab this stump right here and i could use my uh eight key and on the sub palette or i could just use this green tile right here and I'm going to make like a cross, and then I'm going to use these tiles to make a tree. And some people like a design where the stump comes up like that, and some people like the design better where it's solid, sort of a lollipop tree, totally up to taste, um, but I'm going to make that real quick. Now, let's say that that's the only feature that I sort of want standing out on this first screen. No problem. Um, what I can now do is I want to build a background that makes it sort of more evocative as, as far as the center of place. So I'm going to use this sub palette for, I've got this sort of fence that kind of looks like I'm about to enter a cemetery, like a spooky cemetery. And I can tell because of the color that that's not something that I can interact with. So it, it, it lets me sort of have uh, the, the greater detail as far as what scene I'm seeing without having to make it something that I'm going to interact with. I can also add um, some mountains. So I'm going to use this diagonal and then this diagonal. And I, maybe I'll make a second tier of those that will go up higher like this. And what I love about the nest is that you can use this sort of minimal construction where most of it is silhouette and get away with a pretty cool looking you know, mountain range. And I might use this for my moon and my stars so i get like goldish moon kind of a warm tone but still doesn't look like the stuff i can interact with and i've got a few stars here too that i could sort of dot where the mountains wouldn't be that kind of looks kind of interesting um and lastly i've got these trees here um which if i hold the shift key i can click and drag on pieces 
of my tile set. And you can see the swatch turns into that whole thing. I'm going to put a couple of trees here. These are meant to be background trees. Then I'm going to grab the top one. I'm going to make them different heights like that. And that's kind of got a cool vibe. And I, I, you can kind of see that these, again, are background trees. And this is all foreground stuff. And there's some other things that we could do if we want to put like a creepy cloud in the sky or maybe a couple clouds. And then if we wanted to uh, put a gravestone, maybe right here. Now, the question is, is this gravestone something I can interact with? Or is this something that's in the background? It's hard to tell. I'm not really sure what that should be. I could also make some different color ones, but none of them really fit very well. Um, so I wanted like a pink gravestone. But if I just use a gray gravestone, it's using the palette of these, but maybe I can collide with it. Maybe I can't. And then we have to think, is this something that if I walk against it, it's solid and I can interact with it until I jump on it? Is it something that it's it's in the background completely, no matter what I do, I don't interact with it? Or if I stand here, I could jump and then I land on it. It's like a one-way platform. That's going to be up to you. I'm going to leave that to you. What we are going to do now is we're going to add collisions. So right now we've drawn a pretty picture. Basically, we've got ground under my feet. We've got a tree that I'm not going to really interact with, but maybe if eventually I can put some branches up here. I've got this gravestone right here. Um, I'm going to make this a one-way platform. So if I walk, I could jump and I could hop on it. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on collision. And what this shows is an overlay of all the collisions that are on this screen. I can go into where it says underneath tile layout, you can see it says collision and it has zero. And it's important that it says that number zero. We're going to talk about what that number zero means in just a second. If I click this menu, I can see all these different types of collisions. These are all the different types of collisions that I currently have in my game. Pause that. Don't do this with me. Where do those come from? Well, if I look at my script settings that I showed at the very beginning of this, if I look at my tiles, these are the scripts that get called when an object runs into that kind of tile. So why is the second tile a solid tile? Because this, this zero, one, this tile is a solid tile. It runs this solid tile script, which makes an interaction solid to the physics engine. So that's why it works. And what we're going to do is we are going to Make sure that we have solid checked. We're going to move our mouse over where we want. We're not going to click. We're not going to drag because clicking right now would allow us to still be painting these tiles. That's not what we want to do. We want to paint collisions. So I'm going to use my zero key on the keyboard and press the zero key. And you can see it changed it from zero to one and tile, uh, tile type number one is solid. Well, I can continue that. I can hold the zero key and I can just move my mouse anywhere I want to go. Now, just like before, let's say I'm a screw up and I go, whoops, and I do that. Oh, those are supposed to be zero. No problem. I'm going to change this. Oops, I'm going to change my collision back to null walkable and just draw a zero back with those. Now, this one's the strange case. Maybe I want it solid, but that would mean I can't walk through it. Maybe I want to ignore it, and then I would keep it zero. Let's say I want to make it so that I can stand under it and hop on it. No problem. I have one called Jump Through Platform. And we're going to use this for things like tree branches, where if I'm underneath it and I jump, I can jump through it. But if I come from the top, I land on it. So I'm going to choose Jump Through Platform. You can see it's right here. I'm going to put my mouse over it, and I'm going to hit zero. Okay, now we've made a screen. I'm fairly happy with this screen. I can unclick collision. Now I'm just seeing the screen again. I could, I could spend all day just designing this simple screen, but let's make sure that it works. Let's test this. We already have a bunch of inputs. You don't have to do this, but these are the inputs that we already have. This is the object that we already have, and it's already got some details. For instance, it's already got a few different animations. It's already got uh, some settings here in its details. It's already got um, a couple uh, different action states to determine when it should be standing uh, and doing the walking animation. And it's also already got a bounding box set up. So we've already got this player set up. If I wanted to move his position, I could right click somewhere and put place player. I'm pretty happy with him right there on the ground as a starting point. What this does is suggest to the player that I'm supposed to move this way. Obviously, my character is looking at the open field. Pretty logical now because we've grown up with games like Super Mario Brothers. But there was a time when that wasn't necessarily the case. And the psychological effect we have about putting the player on the left looking right is that we're supposed to move in that general direction. That's sort of what it triggers to our brain. So I'm going to now test this. And what it's going to do is it's going to assemble this project. And then it's going to open it in the emulator. And if I hit this button up here, there's two ways to do it. I can either go to test, export and test, or this button in the top ribbon does an export and test. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. 
going to take a second, just click it one time, and then this pops up. Now, this is important to understand. This is said that the demo or game.ness is written and demo.txt is written. That tells me it was a success. This game was successfully written. However, if there was an error in the code, if there was some kind of bug, something wasn't written right, this is where it would give me a warning. It would say, oh, that's that, that was, uh, there was an error and it would not compile. And if I, uh, if I moved on to the emulator, it wouldn't be able to open the emulator because it never actually created the ROM. Okay. So this tells me it was written. And it tells me press any key to continue. So I'm going to press the space bar and it's going to open right here in my emulator. And there's the screen that we just built. So controls right now by default are set up to be WAS and D for your D pad and uh, K and L for your A and B buttons. And that's meant to basically uh, uh, simulate a NES controller, right? You're controlling your movement with your left hand, you're controlling your actions with your right. And right in the middle, G and H, that's your select and start, which we haven't done anything with, with yet. But as you can see, I don't fall through the ground. And now let's check that gravestone. So if I walk to the gravestone, I can walk through it. But if I jump, I land on it. And that's what that jump through platform does. Now, obviously, uh, if I go to the next screen, I haven't made the next screen. So all kinds of weird stuff is going to happen. Right? I don't even know what's happening right now, but I'm in zero land. There is no next screen. If I come back, I'm back on the screen where I just was. I basically have mo had moved from screen zero to screen one. And that's a look at the first day of how easy it is to just kind of crank in and place uh, some tiles in order to make a screen using NestMaker. Um, so already within just 15 minutes, we've got our first screen laid out. We can get into the pixel editor. We can change what some of these graphics look like. We can add some more different types of tiles. Tomorrow, we're going to look a lot deeper at tiles. And we're going to look at some different types of tiles and sort of how they work and how they're tethered to the physics uh, and things like that. We'll talk a little bit about this HUD system, very little bit about this HUD system. Uh, but anyway, that's number one uh, session in the 13 bytes of October. I know it's starting simple. So for those of you guys who are waiting for something more complex, and something new don't worry we're going to get to all that stuff but for now we've made a screen we've played it in the emulator congratulations you are nest making uh, i hope you enjoyed this first video and i hope you enjoy the rest of the series i'll see you guys tomorrow